Good afternoon. Welcome to our True for the Final Generation Health Talk. And I want to welcome all of you, wherever you are. Barbados, the Caribbean, UK, USA, welcome. We are going to be looking at the subject of intermittent fasting. I'm going to be doing it on PowerPoint, so I'm sharing the screen and everybody should be able to follow. So I'm just waiting a minute until it's exactly five to begin. Everybody can see? Okay. Intermittent fasting and its benefits. So in a minute we shall pray, I will give an introduction and we will begin. Welcome again to everyone, good afternoon. God bless you, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege again of sharing the health message. Bless us as we look at this important subject and continue to improve our health and to enable us to reverse uh, chronic diseases in this health reform message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, when we get into the matter of intermittent fasting, uh, let me just say this. In the Bible, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, which is Peter's letter, which we are studying for Sabbath school, and in Galatians 5.22, both of those passages mention temperance or self-control. Temperance or self-control. In other words, avoiding overindulgence in even that which is good and completely abstaining from that which is injurious. That is true temperance. True temperance, self-control, moderation, self-control, being limited in healthy quantity with that which is good and completely avoiding that which is injurious. And both in 2 Peter 1, 5 and Galatians 5, 22, the Bible talks about temperance, self-control, moderation, not overindulging. And we shall see later on that there are some statements in the book, Councils on Diets, which also talk about intermittent fasting long before the modern research even looked at it. So join me then uh, and follow the PowerPoint as we go. And even before we get into that, let me just mention something here uh, in terms of the obesity pandemic that started to develop from the uh, late 70s and 80s and has continued mark, uh, remarkably so. Uh, sugars. Now, fructose is a sugar in fruit, glucose is a sugar in fruit, and sucrose is a sugar in fruit. Some fruits contain all the people use the ads. When we talk about sugar, people, people usually ask the, the difference between sugar in fruit and sugar in sweet drinks and breads and cakes and desserts and so on. And there's a difference. It's the same sugar, but the body metabolizes it differently because of the environment it is taken into uh, along with. Fruit, sugars, glucose, fructose, from beginning now. Glucose and fructose and sucrose, those sugars, when we have them in a whole fruit, are accompanied with fiber and nutrients. And they are not in the concentrated form as in sweet drinks and refined sugars. One of the, one of the most dangerous refined sugars is fructose, as is found in high fructose corn syrup, which started to be used uh, with increasing uh, popularity in the late 70s, 80s, and thereon, and has uh, been shown by epidemiological research, nutrition research, to be a major contributor to worldwide obesity, high fructose corn syrup, and cereals, and a whole host of things 
that people were eating. And fructose in excess is metabolized in the liver and the liver uses it to produce fat. Fructose in small amounts in fruit is okay because it does not cause an insulin burst like glucose and therefore in the context of eating those sugars in fruit that is much healthier than using the refined sugars in sweet drinks breads and cakes and pastries and adding sugar the sugar we use table sugar which is sucrose adding it to all that we do so sugar we've mentioned before is something we always have to be careful with we should not use added sugar or refined sugar or the sweetened drinks and the sugars we use in fruits uh, the sweeter fruits we always have to be moderate with especially if there is obesity and diabetes type 2 but fruit sugar in the fruit much healthier than refined added sugars to what we drink or eat okay we're about to start now uh, and Intermittent fasting, unlocking the hidden secrets of voluntary withholding of food. And this is taken from uh, Dr. Lydia Dennis, family care physician, and uh, it contains some important information which we will examine. First of all, There are some people who shouldn't undergo fasting or intermittent fasting without supervision or at all, pregnant or nursing mothers. Diabetics must be under the supervision of a physician. Infants and children wouldn't need this unless, as is happening today, they are markedly obese. And people who have different and serious eating disorders like anorexia, nervosa, or any of those. What intermittent fasting is not, it is not calorie restriction, it is distinct from calorie restriction, it is not starvation. Starvation is when a person is deprived of food without his consent. An extreme calorie restriction leading to bodily stress and protein breakdown, that would be what starvation would be. We're not talking about that. Intermittent fasting then is a form of fasting. Fasting is the voluntary, that is by choice, and complete refolding of eating food while maintaining fluid balance, drinking enough water. Most commonly, it is a prolonged fast overnight, but can be done over a course of days, a few days a month or a few days a, a week or a year, depending. It's a time of body healing and rejuvenation, a term called auto Fudgy or autophagy, we will look at that a little later on, and it, it enhances the ketogenic process. We will also be looking at that a little bit. So, intermittent fasting is a form of fasting which can take several patterns, which we will look at. It means abstaining from food by choice for a period of time while maintaining adequate water intake. It is most commonly done overnight as we shall see but it can be done over a course of days it can be done over a few days a week a few days a month a few days a year it allows the body time to heal and rejuvenate it enhances a process called a process called autophagy we'll explain that in a minute and it enhances uh what people know as a ketogenic that it enhances the process of ketosis and healthy ketosis is important for gut bacteria and brain health. Now, we should understand that fasting is a normal body process. We were designed to not eat over a prolonged period of time. Uh, if you look into nature, you see that certain animals eat once a month, and those are long lived creatures like some of the uh, reptiles. Now, we were designed to not have to be eaten all the time. Our religious fasting has been observed for centuries without harm to millions of people. Everybody, for example, fasts overnight and in between meals. 
if you when you go to sleep all that period of sleeping throughout the night you're really fasting and we're going to be looking at the importance of this natural fasting as we go along now during the night when you're not eating the body maintains energy energy production by using up glucose that is stored in the form of glycogen glycogen is a storage form of glucose similar to how plants store glucose in the form of starch we can store glucose in the liver and muscle in the form of glycogen and that is then burned up in exercise or fasting so the body maintains the blood sugar during the fasting period through breaking down that glycogen store and also by making new glycogen new glucose if needs be in the liver so first of all we should understand that fasting is a normal body process and we're looking at fasting versus calorie restriction during fasting the body turns on ketosis what do i mean uh, when you're fasting and there is no glucose being taken in insulin levels fall when insulin levels fall this turns on an enzyme called tissue lipase that breaks down fats so that fat is available for your body to use as fuel and as that fat is metabolized a molecule called acetylcoenzyme A is formed and that is the basis of forming ketones or ketosis and one of the ketones beta hydroxybutyric acid is very good for gut health and brain health and health on the whole so ketosis causes fat loss usually in intermittent fasting there is no refeeding syndrome to cause later weight gain there is no stress response by the body if intermittent fasting is done right and then not in an extreme way the metabolic rate does not fall uh, that much only decreases by about 29 kilocalories a day in contrast calorie restriction uh, never turns on ketosis fully fat is lost but people tend to uh, rebound and refeed. The body may be stressed in certain kinds of calorie restriction. Some people carry it to an extreme, but it is not to be carried to an extreme calorie restriction, can be done properly as well. But during calorie restriction, the metabolic rate drops lower than in intermittent fasting. And when the metabolic rate drops lower, uh, the, the weight of fat loss may not be as easy as in intermittent fasting. Some People do a good calorie restriction and combine it with intermittent fasting well that would be a good combination if both are done properly so fasting and ketosis gives enhanced ketosis and a process called autophagy we'll explain that as I said in a minute now fasting just means no food immediately available for energy production by the body the body then has to look inward on energy supply as i said before it uses glycogen which is stored glucose in the liver and the muscle and when that is done it will turn to fat by the mechanism described and as the body uses up fat ketosis results only after prolonged extreme fasting would the body have to turn to protein to make sugar and muscles are then used look for look at, at at a, as an example to Jesus in his fast 40 days and 40 nights now that was a prolonged fast to win the victory for us over appetite and that prepared him for all that he would have to meet thereafter we are not called to fast to that extreme we are just looking at intermittent fasting and the tremendous evidence that we have of its value to us even at the spiritual level fasting has tremendous spiritual advantages we are looking today at the physical advantages for good health but it has also tremendous spiritual advantages so whether we are talking about physical health or mental health or spiritual health fasting is wonderfully important now if you've been doing some people do a keto diet they come off uh, carbohydrates and eat uh, we sh they, sh they eat healthy fats and then they will have gone through 
lowering their glycogen levels and they would have turned to fat and that is ketosis and enhanced ketosis if you now do uh intermittent fasting and you're producing more ketone bodies when you check the urine you'll see ketone bodies it means now that you're burning your own fat and that will be indicated as a purple test in the dipstick in the urine when the urine turns a deep purple showing the ketosis now we look at the modern literature and see some of the studies that have been done on fasting and intermittent fasting some of the studies we have one here by Patterson and colleagues in the journal of the academy of nutrition published in 2016 small studies looking at animals and human studies and they looked at several types of intermittent fasting routines complete alternate day fasting modified fasting based on the 5-2 diet we'll explain that in a minute time restricted feeding like the 16-8 fasting so let's look at some of these another their religious fast like uh, the muslims do ramadan Seventh adventist and other groups fast for spiritual reasons so there are different patterns of fasting uh, let's look at some of these patterns many different ways to do intermittent fasting one common popular one one that we can start with is called the 16 8 method what do i mean by that we allow eight hours as the window for eating and 16 hours as the window for not eating let me give an example suppose you have breakfast at seven o'clock in the morning 7 a.m and then you eat your lunch at 3 p.m from 7 to 3 would have been an eight hour window in the eating period so you had breakfast at 7 you eat again at 3 and then you eat nothing between 3 and the next morning at 7 when you have breakfast again so from 3 p.m all through the evening and the night until 7 the next morning that is 16 hours so that is called a 16 8 intermittent fast breakfast at 7 your second meal at 3 and then between 3 and right through the night to the next morning at 7 you would have fasted 16 hours that is the 16 8 intermittent fast it is popular it works well it is also recommended as we shall see in the book councils on diets in the spirit of prophecy 16 8 fast of course you can have your breakfast earlier or later but adjust the time so it is still a 16 8. notice that you have a window period of eight hours for the eating breakfast at seven second meal at three and then from three right through to the next morning you are fasting for 16 hours that is a 16 8 fast then there are some people who do a 5-2 fast that is this is no in terms of days of the week uh in seven days of the week they select two days to fast it may be every other or two interspersed with normal eating that is a 5-2 fast in terms of the days of the week the 16-8 is in terms of hours of a day that is the most popular and works well you can always start off uh, and build it up gradually but these are common ways of doing intermittent fasting now in terms of the 16 8 fast when we are just eating two meals a day i just want to give you a, a little quotation here from review and herald councils on diets chapter 9 review and herald july 29 1884. listen to what was happening even back in 1884 and now of course it is pandemic uh, overindulgence overeating eating all the time in america every five minutes and eating a lot listen to this quote it is quite a common custom with people of the world to eat three times a day besides eating at irregular intervals between meals and the last meal is generally the most hearty and is often taken just before return this is reversing the natural order a hearty meal should never be taken so late in the day should these persons change their practice and eat but two meals a day and nothing between meals not even an apple 
or a nut or any kind of fruit, the result would be seen in a healthier appetite and greatly improved health. So the two meal a day for adults recommended. Uh, then there's another statement from the same chapter, counsels on that chapter nine. Three meals a day with nothing in between should be the utmost limit of indulgence. Those who go further than this violate nature's law and will suffer the penalty. So uh, people eat three meals a day. Okay, that's the utmost limit. Two would be ideal. And I just read a researcher who did research on the one meal a day plan and it tremendously enhances longevity and is massive in preventing diabetes, obesity, and the chronic diseases. One meal a day, two meals a day, three meals a day, three meals, the utmost limit, two, beautiful, intermittent fasting, a 16 hour plan. You have breakfast in the morning, you have your second meal uh, mid afternoon, and thereafter you are eating nothing till next morning. Remember what I just said, a seven o'clock breakfast, a three o'clock second meal, because your stomach still needs five to six hours to empty after any meal. And then from three right through to next morning at seven, that will be the fasting period. That's called the 16-8 fast, 16 hours of fast, and just eight hour uh, a window of eating. Now, what are some of the benefits of the intermittent fasting? Listen to some of the benefits. First of all, there's a decrease in blood sugar and a decrease in insulin levels. So it helps to reverse the big problem in the world today of insulin resistance, which is common in people who are obese. If you have one more fat than you should, and that is a common problem, you have insulin resistance. Whether you know it or not, you're on the road to diabetes if you don't have it already. And, and by intermittent fasting and eating, consuming less calories on the whole, but intermittent fasting, you're going to reduce your blood sugar and reduce the insulin demand and gradually repair the insulin resistance. Intermittent fasting also reduces markers of inflammation, like interleukins and tumor necrosis factors. So when you fast, you reduce chronic inflammation in the body. When you're always eating, always eating, you're increasing inflammation. Sometimes the best meal is nothing at all. An empty plate is good medicine. If intermittent fasting also decreases triglycerides and increases the good cholesterol, which we call HDL, high density lipoprotein. Intermittent fasting enables you to lose the excess fat that you want to get off and it improves hormones that would be associated with obesity, adipolectin and others. Intermittent fasting stabilizes mood. In intermittent fasting, the body soon gets accustomed to hunger and then the pangs of hunger wane off and you don't feel. There has been no harm shown at all in intermittent fasting. The benefits are there, the source there, uh, the link is given there. Uh, other benefits of intermittent fasting, it can prevent and even reverse diabetes can prevent and reverse many of the chronic diseases. It is extremely good for brain health and preventing Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, as we shall explain when we come to autophagy. It improves the secretion of growth hormone by the pituitary. Not that you're going to grow anymore, but growth hormone, apart from causing growth in children, uh, helps the body even after the time of growing in terms of length has ceased. And most importantly now of all, all these are important of course, intermittent fasting turns on a process called autophagy or autophagy. I'll explain that as I said in a minute. Now, when we fast, when we intermittent fast, the body is allowed to turn on the genes 
for survival. So genes are turned on that produce proteins that reduce inflammation and genes that produce inflammatory proteins are turned off. So fasting is anti-inflammatory. It promotes the expression of genes for survival and for improved immunity and for longevity and for the prevention and reversal of chronic non-communicable diseases. So fasting has tremendous health benefits. Uh, let's look a little bit here at the uh, body and mechanisms. When you are intermittent in your fasting, there is something here that we need to understand as well. The bacteria in the gut, the friendly gut bacteria, the microbiome, the intestinal flora, they are also better off when you're not constantly putting food in the intestine for them. They need their times of feeding and their times of resting. And when we are constantly eating, 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 the gut health, the bacteria responsible for gut health, they suffer because they're not given a break to regulate themselves. And constantly eating interferes too with the, what we call the cycle clock in the brain for certain hormone rhythms. And you see here in this diagram, inflammation, fats, sex hormones, insulin, all of those must be kept in balance. Intermittent fasting will reduce insulin levels, reduce inflammation, keep your lipids or fats in balance, keep the sex hormones in balance. And at the same time, diet and sleep will be balanced with activity, a certain window of time for, eat, for eating, a longer window of time for not eating, in which time there will be sleep as well. And all of this means better health in brain and body, better health of the mind, the thinking process, and so on. So let's look at the effects on the gut biome feeding. Now, normally we have in our intestines trillions of microbes in our gut that make up ba their bacteria, viruses, phages, yeast, and fungi, all friendly, all living in symbiosis with us, all in the gut. They're living there. We didn't know much about them many years ago. We are understanding more about them now. They play a very important role in gut health and in the overall health of the body, but they must be kept healthy. We must have a healthy bacteria, healthy microbial uh, flora in our intestine. These microbes, trillions of them in our intestine, exist in a volume of about 1.5 liters from mouth to anus in the human gut that stretches over 30 feet. There's a natural rhythm to feed in and rest from feeding for these microbes. There is also a seasonality with feeding and fasting built into us and our microbes. And it is important then to understand that just feeding constantly, 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 and not allowing the gut microbiome to have time to regulate itself, and not allowing our own cells to regulate themselves, constant eating and overindulging, like most of the modern people in the, the USA, eating every five minutes and eating a lot so that obesity is not a pandemic. And with these high fructose corn syrup in foods, the research is now showing that the excess fructose as a refined sugar and high fructose corn syrup actually increases the breakdown of vitamin D and prevents vitamin D from doing its work. So imagine this obesity, high fructose corn syrup, excess sugar, which means excess fructose, vitamin D is not doing its work. And then people in Northern climes not getting enough vitamin D and we see the impact on the immune system should a virus come a knocking. Now, what you feed and when you feed matters. Uh, and what you feed your gut with and how you feed it matters. Uh, we need all of the fast foods and junk foods, fried greasy stuff, white flour products, low fiber products, refined sugar products, 
all of those are bad for the gut bacteria. The gut bacteria like whole natural food, roots, fibers, fruits, vegetables, green leafy vegetables, the good carbohydrates like what we call the potatoes, yams, breadfruit, pumpkin, good whole carbohydrates, preferably boiled or steamed in water, whole food, whole natural plant-based foods, very important, but fast foods and junk foods and high sugar foods and refined processed carbohydrates and refined meats cause havoc in the gut microbes and therefore interfere with our immune system, with our colon, and the tight junctions between the epithelial cells are impacted on and we get what some experts call uh, leaky gut syndrome and there are some experts in the u.s doing a lot of research on that and they're saying that even in the medical profession uh, doctors don't understand enough about it to advise patients to eat more healthily natural whole high fiber foods which strengthen the gut bacteria and make the colon healthy, soluble and insoluble fibers reduce the risk of colon cancer, help the colon to clean itself and help those friendly bacteria to maintain a good environment in the gut, helping to prevent colonic diseases like cancer. And also when you eat high fiber whole natural foods and feed your gut bacteria and gut microbes, you reduce inflammation in the body because the good healthy um, microbes in the intestine produce amazing molecules that we're only now beginning to study that get into the body and strengthen the immune system, reduce inflammation, and actually impact on improving longevity. So eating healthy is important for the gut bacteria and a healthy gut bacteria is important for our overall health from brain to foot. And when you feed your gut microbiome matters too. We just, I, I shared a piece of research some time ago that eating after six o'clock in the evening shortens lifespan. And we had a statement from councils on that. People eating any amount, anyhow, very often, and eating late at night, not good at all. The gut microbiome, like our organ system, needs downtime to self-regulate. Feeding the gut microbiome is cyclical, following a circadian rhythm. Food sources and their seasonality availability. Times of fasting associated with food scarcity improves overall health. Constantly feeding, promotes disease, inflammation, and shortens like man. Eating healthily, eating less, with periods of intermittent fasting, prevents obesity, chronic diseases, and prolongs life. Hence, we come back to the Bible. Temperance, self-control, don't overindulge. Second Peter 1.5 and Galatians 5.22. Temperance, self-control, eat less, exercise more, live longer. And intermittent fasting fits into this category even better than, but it can work along with overall calorie restriction. Well, this diagram uh, may seem a little bit busy, but we see uh, bacteria and the quantity we eat, metabolites and immunity, balancing things there. And when we feed our gut bacteria with good food, whole, natural, plant-based foods, your fruits, your vegetables, your green leafy vegetables, whole grains, and healthy carbohydrates. And we avoid refined processed animal products, refined processed carbohydrates, and sugars, and white flour products. And we don't overindulge. And we allow uh, intermittent fasting, in other words, we let our afternoon meal be at such a time that we have a long time and all during the night before breakfast where we rest our gut and rest our bodies the bacteria uh, improve we produce some ketone bodies like propionic and beta butyrate there you see don't mind those chemical words and they improve the health of the gut and the junctions are healthy and the gut is healthy there's less chance of 
intestinal problems, there is good absorption, there is no leaky gut, there is reduced risk of any colonic cancer. If you're eating any amount and anyhow and eating junk foods, you don't produce those same ketone bodies. The bacteria, the gut don't have time to regulate themselves. The good bacteria die off, bad bacteria begin to multiply. We get those junctions in the gut lining being loosed. We get leaky gut, we get increased inflammation. We get all sorts of problems. So eating properly, not only for ourselves, but for our friends, those tiny friends that we can't see, trillions of them in the intestine, or intestinal microbiome, they are very important for immune health, health of the gut, and health of our overall bodies, and how we eat impacts on them, as well as how it impacts on us. So in the gut, we have these bacteria and other microbes, and there's a thick protective mucus layer, beneficial bacterial byproducts like butyrate and propionate uh, come in, so even if we are not making our own butyrate, the bacteria can make it. Butyrate is extremely important for good brain health. The, <clears throat> there are signals that we want there as well. And these microbial signals can signal that things are not as good as they should be. And then there are other adjustments. The tight junctions between the gut lining are maintained and a robust, normal, healthy immune system is the functional result, normal cell signaling for metabolism and immunity. So when we keep our gut bacteria healthy by eating whole, natural, plant-based foods and avoiding refined processed animal products, refined processed carbohydrates, fast food and junk food and french fries and all those things, and sugars, then we're going to keep and eating high fiber foods, we're going to keep our gut bacteria or gut microbiome healthy, eating good natural whole fiber foods. Now, where we have bad bacteria in the gut because we're eating junk, not eating enough fiber, not eating good whole foods, the mucus layer lining the intestine becomes thin. There is bad bacterial overgrowth. The tight junctions begin to loosen and we get inflammation in the gut and leaky gut. The immune system becomes dysregulated. Food metabolism is not right. Cell signaling is impaired. All sorts of things go wrong in the gut lining and the immune function there surrounding the gut and things begin to go downhill. And there are certain experts in the States who say that this is one of the areas that medical science don't know a lot about, but it is extremely important as they're discovering for overall health, keeping the gut or intestinal microbial bacterial family very healthy by eating healthy and by not overfeeding them by having periods of resting the gut. So we're still looking at the gut microbiome and human health, nearly 80%. Look, look at this point, nearly 80% of all basic biology science papers written since 1977 have focused on the gut biome and its relationship to health and disease. Now watch the next statement. This research has been mostly ignored by the medical community. The medical community, I'm a part of the medical community. We were trained to, to focus on diagnosis and drug treatment. We, we weren't taught much about nutrition and diet and the importance of healthy diet. And that is why uh, it is so important to study this area on our own. So 20 years behind bench research, we now begin to see the clinical relevance. Numerous studies have reported changes in the gut Micropopulation during obesity, diabetes, liver diseases, cancer, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and even autoimmune diseases like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and other kinds of autoimmune diseases and brain diseases. All of these are now being shown to be related to whether you have healthy or unhealthy gut microbiome. Amazing. Years of research, largely unknown by even the medical profession. So it only shows the importance of healthy eating 
and timing of that eating as well. So what if instead of saying eat to beat diabetes, we said we don't eat to beat diabetes? Because most of the diabetes in the world, type two, has come from eating too much, eating too often, eating the wrong things, producing insulin resistance, then the pancreas wears out, then there is not enough insulin, and the blood sugar goes climbing. One of the best ways to know if you're in insulin resistance or not is to check your HbA1c. You're not diagnosed as diabetic until the HbA1c gets to 6.5 and above. But you want that HbA1c really and truly below 5.6. And some researchers said if you could get your HbA1c to 4.8, that is amazing. It is achievable by intermittent fasting. It means that there is no insulin resistance. Chronic inflammation is gone. That would be very good. Getting your HbA1c done, not just because you're a diabetic and want to check it, but even if you're not diabetic, getting it done and seeing where it is at and getting it even lower to prevent these chronic diseases, to reverse any trace of insulin resistance and therefore to get rid of chronic inflammation. And Professor Roy Taylor from Newcastle upon Time in England, the Weimar Institute, Adventist Institute in the USA, and now a lot of other people are dealing with intermittent fasting and other kinds of fasting and a strict pure diet and getting diabetes reversed by reducing this insulin resistance and helping the beta -ilet cells to heal, getting the fat out of the pancreas, out of the liver, and healing the process. So diabetes is reversible by intermittent fasting and a pure diet. Should be done, of course, under supervision of a doctor, dealing with your medications, because if you've been diabetic for a long time, then there are going to be problems there, so it has to be well supervised. But Professor Taylor has shown that people who've been diabetic for six years or less, he can reverse them in eight weeks on a pure diet of vegetables. And then thereafter, they go on a, a pure diet thereafter and they're, they're maintained. Calls for discipline, but it only shows that a lot of these things, more and more the research has shown that a lot of these chronic diseases can be reversed by eating less, by intermittent fasting, and above all, a pure plant-based whole natural diet, cutting out all the junk that modern man calls food, but which is really poison, hiding in sugar, and fat, and sweet tasting things. So let's look at the difference between eating all the time and fasting. Eating, you're going to be supplying sugar to be burnt, gaining weight, no gut rest, may cause wrong bacteria in the gut to proliferate, and the standard American diet, SAD, equals a shortened lifespan. It is sad indeed. Fasting now burns fat, lose weight, rest the gut, turns on autophagy, and there's lifespan advantage. So you see the benefits of not eating all the time? We think that we people eat and eat and eat, thinking that they're getting strength and so on. They're killing themselves. They're burying they're digging their graves with their teeth. Eating healthy, eating with temperance, fasting healthily, fasting the right way is a combination that spells longevity and disease prevention. So intermittent fasting is a strategy. It will enhance ketosis, producing beta hydroxybutyrate and helping your gut bacteria to produce butyrate. Increase the internal fat burn, improve blood sugar, increase weight loss, decrease inflammation. And chronic inflammation is at the bottom of so many of the diseases that plague us in this world today. Rest to your gut, induce autophagy, and kill cancer cells. Helps people to recover from chemotherapy as well. A simple way to start, I mentioned already, you can start with extending your overnight fast by two hours. In other words, uh, suppose you have breakfast at seven in the morning and then you eat again at one. 
or some people at 12, 12, 1. Then have your evening meal a little earlier if you're on the three meals a day, so that now you have a longer evening and a whole night without anything, and you would have you would have increased your the normal overnight fast by two hours. I can do that three days a week until you reach the what we call the 16-8 program. Once you're comfortable, extend it to the 16-8 plan. 16 hours of nothing in, in your mouth, an eight-hour window to eat. Let me go over it again. So if you have breakfast at seven and your second meal at three, seven to three, that's the eight-hour period of feeding, but not that you're feeding every five minutes in that period of eating breakfast. Nothing more until uh, the second meal at three. That's the two meals in that eight hour period. And then from three, right away around until seven the next morning, there'll be 16 hours of fasting. That is an intermittent fast. You wouldn't even call it fasting because you would have had two meals and you're just going all around without anything else. And it is of tremendous benefit to gut to bacteria, to the intestine, to all of your body. That's the 16 eight formula. Most people like that. It works well. They get the weight coming off. And they have to learn that spread of prophecy principle. Nothing in between meals, not a nut, not a fruit, only water. And you stick to the two meal a day regime. If you can't stick to the two meal a day regime and you have three meals a day, that is all right. But then just like that fasting night period, be uh, solidly moved from 12 to 14 hours or so. But the 16 day is fantastic. If you're tolerating the 16 eight, three days a week, you can go up to five days a week or all seven days a week. The 16 eight plan. Breakfast at seven, second meal at three, and you'll go right through to breakfast the next day. The 16 eight plan. I can do it every day. But if you're now starting, you can begin it two, two days a week, then go up, I go up until you reach five days a week. And then every day, in that case, then you will need a, a whole fast. Uh, I do the 16 8 plan most days, and some days I still do a, a little whole, whole 24 hour fast. Uh, when you get into fasting, you get to like it. When you understand the benefits and you see what you're doing to your body, you put aside appetite, you learn, you, you practice your body to control and crucify self at the level of appetite. Crucifying self at the level of, of appetite. Spiritual benefit, physical benefit. Christ did it for us. And he gives us the strength to control that appetite. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And that appetite is kept under. Ultimate goal would be 16A every day of the week. That would be beautiful. Practicing, practicing the 16A plan every day of the week. Obesity will vanish. It can reverse, prevent or reverse diabetes. Tremendous health benefits. Breakfast at 7. Second meal at three, and then all the rest of the time, or you can adjust it to suit, suit your working program and so on, but aim for the 16 8 plan. Wonderful benefits. Well, uh, depending on your circumstances, we still have to mention things you have to watch for. Hypoglycemia occurs in some people with particular problems. Hunger, you'll soon learn to conquer that. Some people get irritable at first. That is why you should approach it gradually and build up to it and get accustomed. It is not simple math. It is a biochemical shift. Just as the ketogenic diet, when you cut down on carbs and you burn more fat, but now we are coming to the added benefit of resting the gut, enhancing the gut bacteria, and now doing something called autophagy. What is autophagy? Well, I did a little bit of research on it because it is a new area, a very new area. Autophagy literally comes from the Greek word auto, self, phagy, to eat. It means self-eating. What? Self-eating? What are you talking about? Well, this term, autophagy, was coined in 1974, well, was coined in the 60s by a man who eventually won the Nobel Prize in 1974, a Belgium researcher called... Uh, Christian de Duve, Belgian de Duve, he discovered lysosomes. We, we, uh, we were, when we were in medical school, we were then being told that lysosomes were being researched. And this man, Christian de Duve, uh, discovered lysosomes. 
you see like lysosomes there in the cell lysosomes are little organelles a cell contains its own organs we call them organelles and lysosomes are those parts of the cell that do something of tremendous importance i'm going to explain in a minute and he discovered these lysosomes and he also discovered peroxisomes and he found out that these are organelles in the cell that clean the cell get rid of garbage from out of the cell and help the cell to recycle and repair and we didn't know that before the do did his research in the 60s for which he won a nobel prize in 1974. so what is autophagy it is the process whereby our own cells have the little organelles in them that gobble up and eat up garbage and damaged parts and abnormal proteins and toxins and bacteria that find their way in. So the, this self-eating mechanism is eating up the junk in the cells, getting rid of garbage. We have houses and in our houses, furniture may get old and clothes get old and we throw the old and bring the new. We have to change stoves and fridges after a time. And every day we produce garbage and put it out for the garbage truck. Well, this happens in the cell. In the cell, garbage collects as things wear and tear because we live in a sinful fallen flesh, in a sinful fallen world. And God is so wise foreseeing the fall. He made our bodies able to do these things. These things couldn't have happened by chance. So this gives all the glory to God as we see how fearfully and wonderfully we were made to withstand the effects of sin. And these organelles like lysosomes and autophagosomes and peroxisomes, these do the cleaning up, the laundry, the sweeping, the tidying, the removal of muck, the removal of garbage, getting rid of toxins and helping to recycle things in the cell to keep our cells healthy and living longer. Oh, we're not only discovering this in recent research. As a matter of fact, let me tell you something. Uh, the process of our autophagy the body gets rid of toxins the cells each cell gets rid each cell must do this for its own for, on its own gets rid of waste of toxins of abnormal proteins of damaged organelles of pathogens germs and bacteria viruses that go in i know a brilliant japanese called yoshinori osumi yoshinori osumi and his group won the nobel prize in 2016 for working out the mechanism. There's a lot of biochemistry there. I'm just going to touch it briefly. And they found the genes behind it. They did their experiments in yeast, a clever piece of ingenuity. And then they looked at human cells and found the similarity. There are a lot of genes. We were made with a lot of genes to produce these organelles for cleaning our cells. Why am I telling you all of this? Well, listen, intermittent fasting and fasting and avoiding eating too much and all of the time is one of the best ways to enhance autophagy or autophagy. Helping the cells clean up themselves and renew themselves. So when we fast, this process that caused that that led to two Nobel Prize winners, Dujuv and Oshima, this process helps each cell to repair, clean up, get rid of junk, get rid of garbage, and therefore helps to prevent a whole host of diseases, including cancer and degenerative diseases and diabetes type 2. So when you eat healthy, number one, and don't overdo and don't be eating every five minutes and picking at something and, and can't go hungry, going hungry is a blessing. Breakfast at seven, second meal at three, that's five hours giving your stomach rest, and then a 16 hour gap. You do wonders for your spiritual, mental, physical health, your gut bacteria, and preventing and reversing disease. Uh, well, the process of autophagy, look at it a little bit, see how we are fearfully and wonderfully made. There are receptors in the cell which recognize when the little organelles are parts of the cell, the nucleus, the mitochondria, uh, the Golgi apparatus, all of these are parts of the cell that we didn't know about many years ago. We are so fearfully and wonderfully made to all to God be all the glory. And there are receptors in the cell that recognize the pileup of garbage, that recognize the pileup of garbage, the damage to intracellular uh, organelles, 
and the invasion of other things and the toxins. And these receptors then direct the lysosomes to carry the garbage to the autophagosomes, which link up and engulf and destroy the garbage, keeping the cells garbage free and helping the cells to renew themselves. And they discovered a whole family of ATG8 proteins and the genes behind them responsible for this. Fasting enhances all of this and helps our cells to rejuvenate, to get rid of garbage and to keep young so that although we're getting older in years, the cells keep young in function because fasting enhances this process of autophagy. Wonderful indeed. So these are the benefits. And as we come towards the close, we just mentioned this is the man's name, Yoshinori Oshuni. In 2016, Japanese cell biologists who won the Nobel Prize for Physiology discovered these autophagosomes. And listen to the simple explanation. These are like trash bags inside cells for the collecting of cellular garbage. Inside them are enzymes and chemicals that break down the trash into reusable parts. So everybody's talking about recycling. God had recycling in our cells from ever since. We can never outdo God. So God has this built-in trash removal and recycling in every cell. And Yoshinori Oshumi just discovered most of it after the Douve in 1974. And he just won the Nobel Prize in 2016. Otto Phagosomes become very large when cells are starved and they do a better work. So not eating all the time and fasting helps to turn on this process of autophagy to keep our cells clean and recycled and rejuvenated. Autophagy is, strong, is, is when strong cells do internal cleanup. Our weak cells are induced to die off. The weak cells wasting time, they, die, they are induced to die off. Strong cells, their, their garbage is removed and they're made stronger. When cells don't have adequate time to clean up or to die off, chronic diseases can occur, like Alzheimer's, type 2 diabetes, and cancer. So we must give ourselves adequate time to clean up. And that means we can't be constantly putting in food, putting in food. We have to give them a rest time when we fast. And we're not just talking about special days of fasting. Fasting is part of your lifestyle, the 16-8 protocol. And you give yourselves a chance to rejuvenate, recycle, clean up the mess, and get younger. Autophagy is also protective against infection, like the viruses going around now, and cancer. So that is why obesity is such a risk factor for everything bad. Because the cells are overnourished, they're overfilled. And they can't get chance for this recycling clearance to occur. Your cells need time to do laundry. Your cells need time to recycle. Your cells need time to rejuvenate. This is the process called autophagy. Wonderful biochemistry. It is complex and deep. But we, all we need to know is that it is there, put there by the creator. Those scientists are only now discovering it. And that from biblical times, we saw the Bible stressing the importance of fast. And Jesus said, these kinds are not overcome except by fasting and prayer. And this is both at the spiritual and mental and physical level. The importance of fasting spiritually, the importance of fasting for good health, now come into the light as we discover these amazing things and how we were built by God to overcome adversity. And for us who understand the third angel's message, ready for the final crisis. Conclusion then. It is to your benefit to not eat not just be eating all the time, take a break. And the 16 8 fasting, intermittent fasting program, everybody can do, build up to it, get accustomed to it, it is wonderful. It enhances ketosis, it helps you enjoy the benefits of autophagy as a cellular mechanism of rejuvenation, cleaning up. Fasting is linked to longevity. Fasting can prevent and reverse many of the chronic diseases. It is a wonderful doctrine spiritually and physically, that intermittent fasting and periods of fasting are so good for spiritual and physical health and can prevent and reverse so many of the diseases that plague modern man. And we are told in the book, Councils on Diets and Health, Councils on Health and Councils on Diets, that as you get older, 
uh, you should eat less. Uh, and as you get older, intermittent fasting is even more important. I was reading a valley lady who was 107, not out, and she's there eating her greens. She says she doesn't eat much, no more than two meals a day, sometimes one. And uh, she's eating only a pure diet. She allows her whole body time to relax. She drinks her water. And so this society in which we live is a pandemic of obesity because there's a pandemic of overindulgence. That word in the Bible, temperance, we forgot, but it is there, self-control and allowing this period of intermittent fasting so that our cells can do autophagy and clear up the garbage and rejuvenate. That's it for now. I'll come back to more of it another time, but I know you will have your questions. So I am going to uh, stop the share and open up for your questions at this time. Uh, welcome to all. Some of some came later in this slideshow, but uh, I hope you still got the gist of the whole presentation, the importance of intermittent fasting, the importance of eating less quantity, but better quality and intermittent fasting and a, a pure diet. Questions in the chat? One question, Doc. Yes. Hello, one question. Yes. Uh, just to clarify, what causes people then to become anorexic? Anorexia nervosa is usually a, a condition in which a person so wants to lose weight or so doesn't want to get fat that they develop a psychiatric condition called neurosis, an anxiety neurosis complex, and their, their mind is all jittery and frightened and then it spills over into that. They're not eating anything. If they eat, they can make themselves vomit. And that's a psychiatric extreme position of being fearful of something rather than dealing with the thing in a natural way. Anorexia nervosa. Of course, there are certain chronic diseases like cancer and so on that cause you to lose your appetite, but that is different, a different ball game. Question, Douglas. Yes. Um, what role does intermittent fasting play in mucus formation or the lack of mucus that is. Um, I was reading some research that is saying that um, if you don't overburden your body with a lot of food and such like there's less mucus being formed. And there are some people who are leaning to the idea that excess mucus formation is implicated in a lot of sicknesses in the world. Yeah, well, the thing about excess mucus formation it may be a sign that there is, is either allergic or some other kind of inflammation and tissues are trying to clear themselves. Uh, because intermittent fasting with healthy eating reduces chronic inflammation, it would surely reduce excessive or abnormal mucus formation. We know, for example, that N-acetylcysteine helps to reduce excessive mucus production in the lungs and reduces the intensity of any respiratory infection because it reduces any chronic inflammatory condition in the lungs while enhancing the immune system. Chronic inflammation is reduced by intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting, therefore, will help reduce abnormal and excessive mucus production. Intermittent fasting is a blessing. Anybody Another, wants to willing to give it a try? Another question there, though. Yes. If you, like you take breakfast at 10, yeah. and then eat your last meal at six, wouldn't that compensate for that intermittent fasting? Yeah, that would still be 16, eight, because if you eat breakfast at 10, and your last meal at six, you then have from six uh, uh, in the evening, right through to 10 the next morning, that's 12 and four, 16. That's, that, that's still a 16, eight formula. So mm -hmm. however you can work it into your regime and your practice, some people don't, some people can't tolerate breakfast, so they have their first meal at 12. They have yeah. a meal at uh, five or six and go right around till 12. So you can work the 16 eight to suit your individual taste and your own regime and how you function. But uh, the 16 eight can be practiced anyhow. Once you know you have a eight hour window for eating and a 16 hour window in which you're not eating, that's the 16 eight pattern and you can adjust it to suit your individual circumstance. Okay. 
there are questions on the chat. Questions on so the, chat. the chat. Okay, let me check. I checked just now, but there's some questions on the chat. Brother, uh, I see one here from ZTE Blade A5 2019 to everyone. So fasting during illness will assist in recovery. That's the question. It depends on what illness you're talking about. We're not talking here about acute illnesses. Uh, although, notice, if you have an acute illness like flu or dengue, nature switches off your appetite, you rest and use fluids, and that is good. But we are focusing more on the certain chronic diseases like obesity and diabetes type 2 and rampaging cancer. Intermittent fasting will put a check on those. But even nature teaches us that when you're acutely ill with a flu or cold, your appetite drops, so you rest and use fluids rather than burdening your system with excessive food to allow recovery. So uh, yeah, the answer to your question is really yes. Next question, is your gut good for gut health? And is leaky gut the same as diverticulitis? Well, yogurt is purported to be good for gut health. As vegans or those of us who are vegans, we don't use yogurt, but there is a formula for making your yogurt. Uh, making a vegan yogurt using uh, chickpea flour and allowing a certain degree of fermentation. We'll talk about it another time. Leaky gut is not the same as diverticulitis in, in essence. Diverticulitis, diverticulosis is when the inner lining of the colon squeezes out through the muscular lining, forming little, little outpouches called diverticuli plural of diverticulum, and they can become inflamed, which is diverticulitis, they can bleed, and so on. Has to do with low fiber diet for years and a weakness in the abdominal wall. But leaky gut syndrome has to do with uh, bad bacteria in the gut and toxins which cause the junctions not to be as tight as they should be. And uh, there's not that the inner lining is squeezing through the muscle wall, it's just that the epithelial junctions uh, are not as tight as they should be. One well, question. Yes, go Would ahead. You advise a growing child to engage in intermittent fasting. And secondly, would you object to someone taking a sugarless beverage in between those that two window period of fast intermittent fasting? Okay, first question. First question is if I would recommend intermittent fasting to a growing child? No, we said at the start that intermittent fasting or fasting, not usually for children, uh, growing children, unless that child fits into the growing problem around the world of childhood obesity, where they need to be put on a good diet and intermittent fasting will help them trim off their weight. But apart from that, uh, it is not a thing you recommend for growing children who are otherwise slim and growing. The second one, uh, well, I, I, I thought I recommended uh, a sugarless drink in between me is water. What is a sugarless drink in between me? A herbal what? beverage, like things like um, ginger and... Oh, okay, oh yes, 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 sorry, sorry. Uh, ginger tea, uh, decaffeinated green tea, uh, any of those which would be either zero calories or in minuscule are all right. Okay, water or herbal tea. No problem. Thank you. Brother Douglas. Yes, sir. Um, I like the idea of the intermittent fasting or the two meal a day plan that you um, advocated for the whole evening. But um, please address the idea of how to eat when you eat at those two times during the day. There are a lot of people who just get up in the morning for breakfast. They have a cup of tea with some biscuits and something in between. And then for the three hours, sorry, very unlikely you can eat at three though. But even if you choose to eat at three, then they will have what we call um, the midday meal or whatever the case may be. But there are some people who do not eat properly. So address, give us a little idea of what breakfast should be like. And then that three hour meal, sorry, that three o'clock meal should be like. Because if you don't eat properly, you cannot get through those two um, fasting windows. 
All right, uh, thanks for raising the question. But we are talking about vegan, whole, natural, plant-based diets. People will have their preferences. Everybody's not vegan, everybody's not vegetarian, but I'm addressing our group. Uh, a healthy breakfast, uh, there's so many variations, so many uh, uh, varieties available. For example, I do, on mornings I do a green smoothie. I pick longevity spinach, I pick the herbs and purple cabbage and kale and blend them all up together with some flat seed. And that is it. Sometimes I put, sometimes I do a berry one, but you can have uh, a whole grain cereal with fruit. Uh, I am, I was looking uh, recently at some vegans who developed the technique of using garbanzos or gambazo flour or lentil flour or lentil peas to make whole, oil-free, wholesome, vegan pancakes and flatbread. No wheat, just these grains. So a lot of, uh, if you check, uh, a lot of uh, variations and recipes are available, but you, you, the person can choose, but, but not uh, something sweet and biscuits. That, that's not a wholesome breakfast. A whole grain cereal uh, without any sugar. I'm, I'm not talking about boxed things. Uh, you can oat bran, steel cut oats and stone with your fruit. And it depends on what you want to do. If you're obese and want to come down, a, a green smoothie is good. And uh, fruit, you just have to watch the sweeter fruit if you're already obese or diabetic and want to come down. But a wholesome breakfast would not be white flour products and sugary products and refined meats. And your second meal should be, as we mentioned last week and the week before, your green vegetables, your wholesome carbohydrates, always in moderation, a protein source like lentils or other peas or beans if you're a vegan, a nice, healthy, pure diet, whole food, naturally eaten, not refined processed stuff, uh, not a big set of fried, greasy junk stuff. So we talked about that last week. I just mentioned it again, uh, what healthy eating is for those two healthy meals. Some people, of course, have their cooked meal at breakfast. That is all right. Their, their lentils, their ground provisions at breakfast, and then something later in the afternoon for their second meal. That's excellent as well. You don't have to. There's not one rule for everybody. Everybody can fit the principles into their uh, lifestyle, into their work frame, uh, framework for work and satisfy themselves. But almost everybody can do the 16-8 formula, however they fit it in. So you're not advocating the use of box cereals then? Uh, no, not, not, no, no, not really, no. Full of sugar. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon, Brother Newton. Good yes, afternoon. Yes, sir. Um, no, we've been, we've come along um, with the, the spirit of prophecy um, injunction to use two or three meals a day and eat everything at meal time. Yes. So if there is dessert or what you might call a snack or anything like that, everything to be eaten at meal time, those two or three meals per day. Yes. That, that is now being um, sort of solidified by this new research on intermittent fasting and so on. But there are some people who have been pushing like um, three servings of fruit per day, um, two or three servings of vegetables per day. And that has been interpreted as you eat one serving, no. Another hour, you eat another serving. So that the, the idea of several servings of fruits and vegetables per day is interpreted or translated into eating six or seven times per day. Um, could you address that? Because it seems to me then that if the solid position is two or three meals a day and everything eaten at those meals, then the six or seven servings of fruit plus vegetables per day must also fit into that regime of two to three meals a day. Your, your comment, sir. Yes, you're correct. You're correct. It should fit into that regime. Uh, that 
has been a, a fancy among some people and research, an actual piece of research showed that the stomach and your body is better off when you allow a full five hours between meals and instead of eating every five minutes or every hour and you eat all that you're going to eat at the particular meal time and give your stomach the chance to rest and to digest and rest rather than eating every five minutes. So uh, the, the modern science has confirmed what we've come along with during the spirit of prophecy. Two or three meals a day, no in-between meal snacking, uh, no, no spreading out of the servings of even that which is good throughout the day, eating at those specified times. Uh, the spirit of prophecy calls it reg the, the regularity, that is. Regularity doesn't mean frequently. It means you set a regular time for breakfast and second meal or breakfast, second and third, and stick to those times with nothing in between but water or a non-calorie beverage like uh, a herbal tea. So that's a very good point, Brother Newton, thanks for raising it. Uh, and and therefore, therefore, but basically a serving of fruit would be like a banana, a mango, well, depending on the size of the mango. And, and I mean, so, so, right, so, and, and those of us who, who are into it can eat you know, several servings in one go. Yes. So you don't, you don't have. Um, so you have to spread it out over all of right, the right. Eat it at that time. That's right. And same thing with the, with the vegetables. With you the know, vegetables. Uh, some cabbage, some some broccoli. Yes. The, um, citrus, the leaves. The lettuce, or the salad, and everything, and include that with the meal. That's right. Several servings included in the meal. Included in the meal. Yeah. That's right. Thanks for reinforcing that. Well, our time is gone, but thank you for your sharing and your questions. And I hope you all see the importance then of abstemiousness, temperance, intermittent fasting, and reducing inflammation. What advice would you give for getting rid of stubborn belly fat? Well, stubborn belly fat, intermittent fasting will work. And then I can do some sit-ups and leg raises and exercise, but intermittent fasting, because belly fat is usually an indication of insulin resistance. Intermittent fasting, a pure diet, get that blood sugar level coming down, the insulin level coming down, the body will then burn that fat and burn that fat and just give it time and persevere and the belly fat will come down. Are you, recommend and discipline. Are you recommending the usage of the consumption of vegetables and fruit together? Given every, this is where the advice you gave to Brother Ozzy will seem to me. No, Brother Newton was stressing a particular point of eating what you're going to eat at the meal time. So if you're eating vegetables at lunchtime, you're going to eat them at lunchtime rather than spread them through the afternoon. If you're eating fruit at breakfast time, you're going to eat it at breakfast time rather than spreading it through the morning. That was the point that was being made. With regards to fruit and vegetable, that depends on the person's individual stomach. The spread of prophecy didn't make it a law. It was uh, given as a guideline, especially for those who may have a stomach that is not ideal, okay? But you have to know yourself. I had taken it to have been a law when they first heard it. Thanks for the okay. clarity. Well, uh, okay. Lawyers usually take things for law when they hear them. Okay, everybody, that's a little bit of humor between me and Professor Gelman. Okay, so you see the importance then of this autophagy and intermittent fasting. Uh, I was going to ask for how many of those will be willing to start and begin to experiment and build up to the 16 inch regime. One more question on the, on the chat. Brother, one more question on the chat. Let me just yeah, go and one see. One for the last one. Uh, does the sunlight hours have an impact on digestion? If so, the reason why the times for eating should be earlier, even with the 16 plan. I will have to do some research into that. I, I heard somebody mentioning that, but I haven't gone into it, so I can't give you an answer right now. I will research it. And somebody asked before the program, even started to look at diet and yeast infection in women and uh, proneness to fungus infection. Too, much, too many sugars, overeating, increase the risk for those things, but I'll deal, deal with them fully in another session. 
uh, avoiding refined sugars, eating a pure diet cuts down on the tendency for those kinds of things. All right, I want to thank you all for listening, for sharing, for asking. And this is a good program to be on. Uh, some of my friends who may be fighting uh, extra fat, having dealing with preventing type 2 diabetes or dealing with it, I recommend a 16-day intermittent fasting plan with a pure diet. You can only win. You can't lose. Good evening and God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our health discussion this evening as we focused on the benefits of intermittent fasting within the context of a good health, healthy diet, aiming for the two or three meal a day, two meal a day intermittent fasting, and the benefits at the cellular level of autophagy. Bless us as we pursue health reform. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. God bless you all. That